Hi, in today's video we're going to be talking about high Achilles tendonitis or tendinopathy. And so pains around the higher portion of the Achilles which is near to where it attaches into the calf. These are not very common types of Achilles pain but we're going to delve into what sorts of symptoms can you get up here, what's going on and how you can manage it. I'm Ali, I'm one of the physios from TreatMyAchilles.com. We're an online physiotherapy service treating all things related to Achilles injuries. If you're interested in finding out a little bit more about us or book an appointment, please have a look at the description below. So looking at the anatomy, the high Achilles or proximal Achilles, proximal being nearer to our body, distal mean further away, is around the type area where our calf turns into our Achilles tendon, which is a bit higher up than what you actually might think. So if my Achilles tendon starts at the butt of my heel, comes up and then it starts to disappear around about here where it turns more into my calf muscle. So we're talking about pain in this higher area. The most common areas are lower down this mid portion section or nearer the base at the insertion. So they are the more common areas where people feel it. So that's why where your pain is felt for an Achilles problem matters. And we have series of videos on both of those other types of Achilles tendinopathy. So please have a look at those if they apply to you. The higher up Achilles tendinopathy, like we said, is less common, but is still there and it's still linked to maybe more of an overuse injury. So what does overuse mean? It means that I've suddenly started doing something or I've been building up for a long time and to do an activity and my Achilles has started to grumble at me and cause me a problem. I'm typically likely to feel it when I first start doing that activity, then it might warm up and I feel a bit more comfortable or indeed it might be quite comfortable completely through that activity and I don't get any symptoms until nearer the end. Another common time to feel it would be if I've been stationary for a while. So for example, I've done something today, I've been stationary overnight, I wake up in the morning, I start to walk and move and it feels stiff and tight around that area. Or equally, if I've done something, then I've sat still for a while or I've been driving in the car and then I get up and start to move, I can feel it in that area. So that normally corresponds to what I've done the day before. So we've got lots of videos about what happens when we have an Achilles tendinopathy or tendinitis. So the things we're looking for when we're trying to diagnose that is someone's history, something changing in their activity. So it could be something like, I've not done much because I've been poorly or I've gone on holiday and now I've gone back into my normal activity or I've suddenly changed my activity. So I've decided that instead of doing um, walking, I'm going to start running and I'm going to suddenly go from this level to this level and I've got a sudden increase. Or I've gone out and I've started to change my activity. I normally, let's say, do sports two or three times a week. And now I've upped it to six or seven times a week. Or I was running at a certain speed and now I'm trying to add in speed sessions. And I suddenly added those in. Equally, it can be related to changes in footwear. So things like wearing flip-flops or sandals during summer or wearing more welly boots or boots that flop up and down on our feet so they're less well fitted. These are the sorts of things that tend to tell us whether we're getting um, signs and symptoms of a tendonitis or a tendinopathy. It is not normally related to sharp, sudden pains or pains that have just come on with an accident or an incident. So we've had a bit of a chat and we've started to work out that we think there's something going on in that higher Achilles tendon. We're suspicious that it is an Achilles tendonitis or tendinopathy. What we would do next is then have a bit of a feel, which you can do yourself. So if you were to feel from where you can't start to feel that tendon start from your calf all the way down to your heel, 
you're looking for areas that might feel a little bit more tender or areas that might feel a little bit different in size or shape. But we are going to compare that to the other side. So if you have an asymptomatic or non-symptomatic size and we have something on the other side, is it different? Because it can be quite commonly tender in that Achilles. We're looking for that to be up around that higher Achilles area. And that area is called your musculotendinous junction. So that's where your big calf muscles come down and they seamlessly join into your Achilles tendon. So the force from your muscle gets changed into the force going through your tendon, which goes down to your foot and creates that push off movement, that plant flexion movement. It's around this area that we're thinking, well, are we, is it an Achilles tendinopathy? Probably with those two things we've just done. But what else could it be? If your signs and symptoms are looking more like sudden onset of pain, you've got some redness or some swelling or some bruisings come out, you've got a sudden loss of function. So after that immediate pain, I now can't raise up onto my tiptoes well or comfortably. I've lost some strength. Or if you've heard a snap or a gunshot or a pop type sound or you have felt that happen in your calf, the odds are that this is no longer an Achilles tendinopathy or it wasn't relevant to that in the first place. It could be a calf tear or something might have happened with the Achilles tendon itself. And we have a video on proximal Achilles ruptures and tears, which might be then relevant to look at. So now we're thinking, OK, yep, I'm still thinking it might be an Achilles tendinopathy. What else could be in this area? So what we would then do is start to think, can we rule out any other issues? And what we're looking at there is if there is anything that can refer into that area. So typically your back has its nerves that run down the back of your leg. And the area that refers into the back of the calf is that lower, lower back area. So that L5, S1 area. So we might be asking you then some questions about do you have any history of back pain or pain going into your bottom or down your legs? And we would start to look at some of the tests that might be relevant to whether your back is not moving as well as it could be or whether we've got any tightness in those structures around that area. We may also do a test called a slump test, and I'm going to demonstrate that to you now. This slump test needs to be comfortable. So if you start to do this and you start to feel anything, you stop and come back out of it again, and you speak to a clinician. Your hands would come behind your back, you slump and you put your chin onto your chest. In as far as you can feel like you can go comfortably, you then straighten one leg up and you pull your toes towards you. You notice what you feel and there might be a nice big old stretch and that's completely okay. And if that changes with you looking forward, it's worth making a note. What does it feel like with my head down versus what does it feel like with my head up? And then we'll do the same on the other side. So again, what does it feel like with my head down? What does it feel like with my head up? And does my bad leg feel different to my good leg? What we're trying to look for there is if there is anything called neural tension. So this doesn't mean that there is anything necessarily wrong with your nerves or an injury in your nerves. It just means that your nerve isn't so happy at the moment. So it can be causing some irritation around that area uh, where you're feeling symptoms and that area you would feel symptoms when you did that slump test or you might feel tightness over that area when you do that slump test or it might be different one leg to the other. There is a nice article on how nerves can be related to tendonitis or tendinopathies and we've attached that below. So if you're now suspicious this could be you or that test was positive, it was different with your head down to head up or it was different one side to the other or it replicated symptoms during or slightly afterwards, then it is worth having a look at that article below and also reaching out to see a physiotherapist. Do you need any scans, tests or x-rays? No, not usually. If that slump test was positive, normally that can be treated by looking at different movements 
that you can do in your body to help that nerve move up and down and not cause any issues in that area. Is it related to what's going on in the Achilles? Well, that would be our next assessment. Would we need anything investigation-wise if it's related to back? That would depend on individual cases, but nine times out of ten, no imaging is necessary. So what we're looking for if we're now not suspecting any of those things and we're down the route of, oh, this looks like a straightforward high Achilles tendinopathy. We're starting to think, OK, we need to manage this. And we would be managing this in a similar way to a mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy. And this is where a lot of the research base is out there, scoops up higher Achilles pain with mid-portion pain and puts it all into the same research papers. They don't tend to distinguish between the two. Just in a nutshell, it's basically two-pronged attack. You're looking for calming it down and then we're looking to build it up. So calming it down, we're trying to reduce the irritation of the Achilles. So what can we edit in your normal life that are your most aggravating factors? Now, please remember, again, you may not feel the pain in the moment that you're doing that activity. You might get that later that day or the next day, or to, you might actually feel even better from doing that activity. But it's that knock on that latent feeling that we're interested in. So how can we edit this activity to reduce that latent feeling? It might be that we do less of a step count or we jog walk instead of water, uh, running. We remove the sprints but keep going with the jogging. Um, it might be that we remove some of the days that we're doing activity to increase the amount of rest days that we have. It may be that we need to look at different footwear and what you're wearing and how you're moving around. And those sorts of things, again, can be found in links below. The second prong attack is we calming it down. Now we need to build it up. We need to make that Achilles and that calf muscle unit together stronger. The more strength, the more robust that unit is, and the more robust it is, the more it can cope with activity. And the good news is that this two things can be done with little expense because it's all about time and doing exercises over a period of time. But they need to be tailor made for you because different exercises we might see might be too hard for us or too easy for us. And equally, sometimes they might make us feel more sore if our Achilles isn't ready for it or they might be too easy and they're not really doing anything to help us. The idea is what we would look for in an assessment is where you're at currently and what can it tolerate. And it might start with some exercises where you are just going up at part way and holding and not moving. Or we might do some body weight exercises where you're doing grazing up onto your tiptoes and back down again on two feet or one foot. We may include that off a step. We may do different speeds. And that would then move on to having weights. And once we've hit a certain amount of strength, we then start to look at hopping, jumping or going back to sports and activities, depending on who you are and what your goals are. The clue is here building up. So we're slowly, progressively building up the strength over time. It's that build up over time that's then going to create more strength and robustness in that Achilles and calf, which means you're going to be able to do more and normally goes hand in hand with less symptoms at the same time. So we have lots and lots of information on treatments and what's good and what's not so good to try for Achilles tendinopathy. And we have lots of information below on different types of things that we can offer with exercises and relative rest. And you can find all of those links in more detail at the bottom. So in conclusion, the proximal Achilles tendonitis or tendinopathy or high Achilles tendonitis or tendinopathy is not very common. It's more common to get the mid portion or the insertional Achilles. If you were to get it, we would be looking for symptoms that relate to a tendon, which might be with loading. It might be over a 24 hour period after you've done some loading. And we're looking for a history of suddenly or gradually building up to a point where your Achilles can't cope with that load anymore. We're then looking at building up the resilience to that tendon and calf complex by calming things down and building things up. 
Most of the evidence base puts the high Achilles tendon issues in with mid-portion Achilles tendon issues, so most of the research is relevant to both of those things. I hope you found this um, video informative and useful, and please have a look at the links below. Thank you.